Now, our Saturday play. Winston Graham is probably best known for his Poldark novels, but in 1961 he wrote a disturbing psychological thriller, Marnie, looking at the dark secrets which could make a young, attractive woman turn to a life of crime. Set originally in the West Country, a place Graham knew well, the book was made into a film, transposed to America and directed by Alfred Hitchcock. This radio version returns to the novel's original storyline. Marnie by Winston Graham Dramatised for radio by Sean McKenna With Jade Williams and Patrick Kennedy The name is important It has to be neither too ordinary Nor too unusual Just a name Like a face That'll go along with the crowd Marion Holland stole £1,100 from Crombie and Strutt in Birmingham. Molly Jeffrey got away with 900 from the Gaumont in Manchester. And Peggy Nicholson helped herself to 700 in Newcastle. The Christian name has to be like my own, too, or I might not answer when called, and that can be awkward. You never think of your own family as peculiar, do you? I paid the rent on the house Mother shared with Lucy Nye in Torquay. I can't remember a time Lucy wasn't there, with her tea leaves and her funny ways. Marnie, dear. Hello, Lucy. I said you'd be coming. Had one of me dreams. Don't you look a picture. Like a film star. Who is it? Hello, Mother. Didn't I tell you? My dreams never lie. This is a Christian household. Nobody wants to hear about your silly fancies. Make us some tea, Lucy. Marnie's come a long way. All right. Lord knows how long it'll take her. Coming out of the draft, Marnie. You never get a gleam of sunshine on this side of the avenue. Here, 150. That should keep you going for a while. You're a good girl. There's a house in Seymour Avenue for rent. Dearer than this, but it gets the sun. It's a better part of Torquay, of course. The rent here is paid up till July. I suppose it depends what you like to see your mother in. That blouse you're wearing. French silk, isn't it? I got it in a sale. I hope you're not extravagant. The Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. Many's the sermon your granddad preached on that subject. It also says money answereth all things. I don't think I like your hair that colour. Blonde hair looks as though you're trying to attract men. Here we are, nice and strong. You look a bit peaky, dear. I hope Mr Pemberton isn't working you too hard. Only I dreamed you were in trouble. Why would she be in trouble? Private secretary to a millionaire who treats her like his daughter. Travelling all over. You must see more of Mr Pemberton than his wife does. I'm not in trouble. And there's nothing wrong between Mr Pemberton and me. I'm his secretary. Marnie's not like that. I brought her up properly. Mr Pemberton, my fictional boss, explained me being away a lot, why I'd paid for elocution lessons and why I was flush when I came home. I might say Marion, Molly and Peggy stole the money to look after Mother, but it wasn't as simple as that. I liked nice things too. When you've been really poor, it leaves a mark. And of course, there was Forio. There, my darling. Have you missed me? Marnie's here. The moment I laid eyes on Forio, I knew he had to be mine. At the Cheltenham races. Forio won his race, but he was injured in the last few yards. I couldn't let them put him down. I boarded him at Garrett's farm, near Sirencester. The cost was awful, but when I rode him, I felt free. Go on, Forio! Go! The job I went after this time was an assistant cashier's position with a firm of printers in Barnet, Rutlands & Co. I was interviewed by two of the directors, both quite young. 
We're a family firm, Mrs. Taylor, and we want our staff to feel like family. Terry Holbrook had a touch of the Troy Donahues about him. He knew it, too. Tell us about yourself. I'm Mary Taylor. My husband died last year. We were living in Cardiff, but I'm from the East Coast originally. I didn't work while I was married, but after he died, I... Is something the matter? Mr. Rutland, is it? No. Why? You're staring at her, Mark. Do forgive my cousin, Mrs. Taylor. He thinks he's Heathcliff. That's nonsense. I apologise if I've made you uncomfortable, Mrs. Taylor. You haven't. Good. I'm glad. But he had. I don't know why. They offered me the job on the spot. There's a place in Plymouth where you can buy blank insurance cards. And references are never hard to fix. I started the next Monday. Three weeks later, I found myself at the firm's annual dance. You don't always do the clever thing, do you? Oh, do you think Mark Rutland's like Lawrence Harvey? Oh, I bet you look marvellous in uniform. Was he in the army then? Navy, till his dad died and he joined the firm. Quite put Terry Albrook's nose out of joint. They're always at each other's votes. Oh, look out! He's coming over. Perhaps he'll ask you to dance. Dennis from sales watching. He'll spit tax. Hello, Mr. Oldbrook. Oh, yes. Hello. It's dawn, isn't it? That's right. From accounts. Yeah, Mrs. Taylor, would you care to dance? Oh. I haven't really welcomed you to Rutland. It's Mary. Am I right? Mrs. Taylor. And I'm afraid I don't dance. <laughs> I'm sure you're being modest. I can dance, but I don't. Her husband. Of course. There's a lot you must miss about being married. I know I do. <gasps> Perhaps you play cards. I have card parties most Saturdays. My more adventurous friends enjoy them. You'd be very welcome. I don't gamble. You might enjoy yourself. Please, don't touch my arm, Mr. Holbrook. Most women don't consider it an insult to be thought madly attractive. I mean no offence. I'm simply not interested. I see. Well, um, enjoy your evening. Well, that told him. <laughs> that was that, I thought. A difficulty avoided. I didn't speak to the other director, Mark Rutland, until the day I went to his house with some proofs to be checked. He'd had an accident and had hurt his foot. I'm sorry to send for you like this on such a dreadful day. Do excuse the TV, I was just watching a race. It's Kempton Park, isn't it? Are you keen on racing? I love it. Really? Me too. Do you often go? When I can. Not often. My, my husband was fond of it. Ah, oh, yes, of course. I'm sorry for your loss. One hears a lot about how one should deal with these things, but in reality it's a new page, isn't it? Absolutely new. My late wife hated racing. <sighs> Cover the mirrors, dear. If you see the lightning in them, you'll see the devil peering out at you. Are you all right, Mrs. Taylor? Oh, would you mind turning off the TV? The, the, the lightning. I'm, uh, I'm sorry. <sighs> Thunderstorms always put me in a panic. The chances of being struck by lightning are really awfully small. I know that. I, I know all the answers. It doesn't help. I wonder... Please don't misinterpret me, but I'm going to Newmarket on the 23rd. Would you like to come? I suppose I thought it wouldn't matter. I'd already chosen the day Mary Taylor would leave Rutlands. What do you fancy for the three o'clock? Telepathy. Really? I saw her being trained as a one-year-old. She's come in second twice in the last month over longer distances. She should do well today. If you do know your stuff, I'll put a fiver on her. Shall I put something on for you? No, thank you. I don't bet. Why not? I'm afraid of losing the money, I suppose. There wasn't much where I came from. If you don't bet, why do you like the races? The horses. Ah. Do you ride? Not as much as I'd like. Oh, Lord, come away. Those teddy boys are making a nuisance themselves. Them? They're not true teds. Just rough types following a fashion. 
That's all it is. Just as it's the fashion for men like you to wear a jacket with slanted pockets. Well, men like me don't gang together and make a scene. Well, you've been brought up to know better. In a decent home. You should see some of their homes. They're not bad. Not really. They just have no prospects. This is all their lives will ever be. Wouldn't that make you kick off a bit? Not for the surprises, Mary. I hope you're enjoying today as much as I am. <laughs> I had a little brother once. Mum had him in 1943 when I was six. He died at birth. We were poor and there was no health service then. Mother was never the same afterwards. Dr. Gascoigne did something terrible to my insides. The pain, Marnie. That's all any man brings you. Pain and blood and shame. Since her health got bad, I'd never given her less than 400 a year. I could get enough from Rutlands to keep us both for 18 months. A whole week in Ramsgate. Fancy. We stayed in Margate last year, but Ramsgate's a cut above. I'm sure you'll have a lovely time, Dawn. Hmm. You're not worried about doing the pay packets, are you? Not at all. Mr Ward will fetch the cash from the bank on Thursday afternoon. You just put the right amount in each pay packet ready to be collected on Friday. Oh, and you'll have to open Mr Oldbrook's post while I'm gone. But, but don't open anything marked personal. He gets ever so shirty. But Terry Holbrook's personal letters, I quickly discovered, were boring things about shares and equities. That Thursday, Mr Ward brought me £1,300 in cash. I'd spent a few evenings beforehand cutting up paper into banknote-sized pieces. I put those in the pay packets and the real money in my handbag. You can get a lot of cash in a normal-sized handbag if it's empty to begin with. You're sure I can't interest you in a card party on Saturday, Mary? Quite sure, Mr Holbrook. Thank you for asking. From then on, I had it down to a tea. Home, a gin and French, then a hot bath. Then I put on new clothes, so when I walked out of that bedsit, I left Mary Taylor behind. I took a tube to Paddington, then a train to Wolverhampton. Mary's trail had to peter out, you see. I went to Swindon and paid some money into an account I kept there, using the night safe. I reached Sirencester by Sunday lunchtime. That's my beauty. My lovely Forio. He was restless. I didn't think they'd been exercising him enough. I wanted to have it out with Mr Garrett, so I went straight over to the farm. Good ride, Miss Elmer. <laughs> uh, there's a gentleman asking for you. A gentleman? What gentleman? That would be me. I didn't move. I couldn't. I felt too sick. I have my car here. Perhaps I could give you a lift home. How did you find me? That doesn't really matter, does it? Margaret Elmer. That's how you're known here. Is it your real name? All I can say is... I'm... Terribly sorry. Let's skip the emotional scene, shall we? Where's the money? Some of it's in my suitcase. The rest is safe enough. If you turn me over to the police, I shan't tell you where. But if you promise not to, I'll return every penny. Do you think you're in any position to strike bargains? Answer my questions. Where do you come from? Plymouth. You told Rutland's Cardiff. That was Mary Taylor. Are your parents still alive? My father was killed in the war. He was in the Navy, like you, Mark. My mother died soon after. I was brought up by a family friend called Lucy Nye. What I told him had bits of truth in it. I said Lucy was dead too, that I'd inherited her house, sold it to buy Forio, and changed my name to get a new start. I never meant to steal from Rutlands, but... Once I realised I, I, I could, I I was swept along by the idea. It took time to cut up the paper, hardly a spare-of-the-moment thing. I, I got carried away. I've been poor, Mark. Poorer than you could ever understand. You never forget what that's like. And when you suddenly find yourself holding a thousand pounds in notes, 
I'm not wicked, Mark. Just weak. And it's hardly as if I could come back, is it? Why not? Well, you. How could I face you again? The way I felt about you. The way I thought you'd started to feel about me. Go on, Rutland. Bite. Nothing could ever have come of it. You're pretty much out of the top drawer. I'm something sucked up by the vacuum cleaner. Just hand me over to the police, Mark, and have done. Don't worry, you're not in jail yet, Margaret. People call me Marnie. Where are you taking me? I told you, home. My home. What then? Tomorrow's Monday. You'll go to work, as usual. <laughs> at Rutland's? Don't joke. Nothing's wrong at Rutland's. Nobody knows what you did. I'd promised one of the lads a bonus. I forgot to tell you, so first thing Friday morning I went to your office. You weren't there. As soon as I opened his wage packet, I saw what you'd done. I sat and thought about it for a good while. Then I went to the bank, drew a thousand pounds from my personal account and put everything right. Why? Terry Holbrook always said you were too good to be true. I didn't want to hear him say I told you so. And you're right, Mania. I do have feelings for you. I didn't dare hope. But it's too late now. Doesn't that rather remain to be seen? Mark, I'm no good. I'm a thief. Forgive me, if you can. And let me go. I can't do that, I'm afraid. I'm in love with you. Love's built on trust. You can't possibly trust me. Love grows where it grows. What it builds on is anyone's guess. I followed you halfway across England. You think I'm going to lose you now? How did you find me? I'll tell you on our honeymoon. He had me cornered. If I said no, he'd go straight to the police and I'd go to prison. I had to stop Mark looking any further. So, I went back to Rutland's. And when, a couple of weeks later, Mark threw a small engagement party, I smiled and went along with it. Mark told me he loved me, again and again. I hated him for it. Well, well, quite the dark horse, Mark. It is Marnie. Is it so hard to keep up? It's a nickname. I was christened Margaret, Margaret Elmer. As many names as there are stars in heaven. You do like to talk in riddles, Terry. It doesn't amuse me. I doubt it amuses anyone. I wouldn't have thought Mark was your style, my dear. Too straightforward. I'd have expected you to go for someone with dark corners and hidden crannies. I find Mark quite surprising enough, thanks. The bloom will soon wear off, Marnie. I wouldn't bet on it surviving the honeymoon. I'll be waiting for your phone call. We went to Mallorca. Mark had booked us a beautiful room in a hotel right on the town square. Funny how much better Rioja tastes here. Please, Mark. You're breathing down my neck. So? You promised to tell me how you found me. It's now quite the moment. On our honeymoon, you said. You promised. It was telepathy. There's no such thing. That day at Newmarket, you suggested we back a horse called telepathy. You said you'd seen her training as a one-year-old. I looked her up, who she belonged to, who trained her, where. I followed my nose and it led me to Sirencester. Garrett's was the third stables I tried. I'd almost given up hope and then you rode up the lane on Forio. So, if I hadn't told you about that horse, you'd never have found me. What a good thing you did. Kiss me, Mrs. Rutland. No, Mark. Don't be shy. I mean it. Marnie. I'm sorry, I, I, I can't. Please, don't touch me. Darling, are you afraid? I'll be very gentle. I, I can't stand it, Mark. I understand. It's unfamiliar. You need time. I can wait, Marnie. I want you to be happy. All through the next few days, Mark was kind and thoughtful. Good company, even. But every time I met his eyes, that was there like a bailiff at the door. On the Thursday, there was a fiesta in the square. 
We watched from our balcony. <laughs> What's funny? Those lads. Trying to get the girls to talk to them. All that posturing and giggling. And all they want is something that's over in five minutes. If I showed you a new accounting system, a better way to keep the books, would you try it? I expect so. Have you been to a Spanish fiesta before? No. Do you like it? Very much. Would someone telling you about it be the same thing? Of course not. Then don't let yourself be told about love. It's not what I've been told. It's what I feel. You can't feel anything about an experience you haven't known. You haven't, have you? Of course not. I haven't any memories of that sort. Then for God's sake, help me make some. Do you insist? You're my wife, Marnie. You made vows. So, time up. No more excuses. That wasn't pleasant for either of us, I'm sorry. A man wants his wife to join him, not submit to him. I didn't submit. You forced me. I wanted you very much. I thought you'd... I love you, Marnie. Well, I don't love you. Then why did you marry me? To stay out of jail. Why else? If I hadn't, you'd have gone to the police. You should have thought it through more carefully. I covered up for you. <laughs> Legally, no crime was committed. It would only ever have been my word against yours. Oh, 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 God. I need some air. Esther. We'll work through this money. We'll be happy. I don't see how. I looked down at the square below, thronging with people. How far down was it? Twenty feet? More? Was that far enough? It was a risk worth taking. Oh, no, you don't. Oh. Oh, why won't you let me? You're 23 years old, Marnie. You're clever and you're beautiful. Dying is the last thing you should want. Oh, I've got nothing now. You have me. And that, of course, was the trouble. When we got home, Mark and I had separate rooms. After a few weeks, I began to relax. In the garage, I found an old two-seater which Mark said I could drive. I didn't dare risk the journey to Torquay. I couldn't do there and back in a day. I started to fret. Mother would need more money quite soon. I never for a moment dreamed that Terry Holbrook would be my guardian angel. Hello? I thought I might persuade you to change your mind about my party. You've no idea what I'm talking about, have you? I'm having some friends over on Saturday. I invited you both, but Mark gave me a very firm no. As if his new bride could possibly be corrupted by a few drinks and a little game of cards. I don't play poker, Terry. Oh, it's easy to learn. I'll teach you. Mark wouldn't approve. Oh, wouldn't that add a certain frisson? You're very welcome to come by yourself. You'll be a natural, my dear. If I come, and I mean if... Will you promise not to flirt with me? Of course not. I told Mark I was going out with Dawn. I said her mother was ill and she needed support. He didn't object. Terry showed me the basics of poker. I played a couple of hands and I watched very carefully. The second week, I made six pounds. The third week, I was down thirty-two and six... But the week after that, twelve pounds clear. Terry was right. I was a natural. There's only one thing wrong with your game, Marnie. Mm. Knowing when your luck has run out. It's like 
Being aware of a gentle breeze, if it blows with me, I know that with reasonable cards I'll make money. And with good cards, I'll make quite a lot. But if it blows against me, I cut my cloth accordingly. I'll bear it in mind. Have another drink. Nice try, Terry. I'll see you next week. A whole week. An empty desert stretching ahead. I've had an idea. Mm. Uh, we could turn the old garage into a stable. You could keep Forio here. Do you mean it? We could ride to hounds, join the thorn hunt. You'd like that, wouldn't you? <gasps> you know I would. Then, um, let's make a deal. What sort of deal? I, I bumped into an old friend of my father's last week, a chap named Charles Roman. He's very gentle, very wise. He's a psychiatrist. You want me to see a psychiatrist? I don't like sex, so I must be sick in the head. Well, seeing a psychiatrist doesn't mean you're sick in the head. A great many people do it these days. I won't agree to it. Why should I? I'd, I'd very much like you to be able to enjoy something pleasurable and important. Something you consider pleasurable and important. Something most people do. Marnie, I, I need to know if it's love you can't stand or just me. Roman might help. People think I'm lucky to be married to a man who's upright and straightforward. They've no idea of the twists and turns in you. I am straightforward, Marnie. I love you and I want you to be happy. Having Forio here will make you happy, won't it? And of course he was right. The day the horse box pulled up on the drive, I felt my heart lift and swell. Oh, my boy. Forio. I'd controlled myself all my life. I could hold my own with Charles Roman for two hours a week. Do make yourself comfortable. You should know that I'm only coming here because my husband wants me to. I don't like sex, you see. He thinks you can cure me. I can do very little without your cooperation. Perhaps we could start by your giving me the general factual background to your life. I told him the same story I'd told Mark. It sounded so straightforward I believed it myself. But I soon learned not to underrate Roman. You could imagine you were doing awfully well when you weren't, at all. Over the next few sessions, he started his mind games. What does the word rain suggest to you? It's always raining when I come here. My umbrella leaks a pool in your hat stand. Water. Kettles. Hot baths. Sometimes I have two or three a day. Soap. Plugs, water. Baptists. Blood. Tears. Toil. Baptists. And his tears shall wash away thy sins. My mother took me to chapel three times every Sunday. When you were so young. Careful, Marnie. Lucy Nye was just as bad after Mother died. Do you love your husband? Of course. What does love mean to you? Forio knowing my step. Warmth. Big arms round me. A kitchen with a fire burning. God so loved the world. And sex? Whatever I say, you'll twist it to fit your theories. I won't be thought of as a freak at a sideshow because I have likes and dislikes and stick to them. Apart from not wanting your husband, are you happy in other ways? Why shouldn't I be? I wonder if you sometimes slightly pride yourself on being withdrawn from life. As if you've grown a protective skin. There's a risk it will harden until the real you inside shrivels and dies. <laughs> And you think talking is going to help? It might. <laughs> if you can stop being so frightened of what you're going to say. Forio's looking very handsome. I want him to look his best for the hunt. Have you got a mount yet? Rex Newton Smith's lending me a hack. We're dining with them the evening before, by the way. All right. I can't promise it'll be as exciting as one of Terry Holbrook's poker parties. 
Have you been having me followed? I happened to ask Dawn how her mother was. She hasn't been ill at all. It wasn't hard to find out the rest. Why shouldn't I go to Terry's parties if I want to? Why lie to me? I thought you'd disapprove. I do. Everything Terry Holbrook touches turns sour. He's behind all the trouble at Rutland's. What trouble? The takeover bit. I told you about it. I can't have been listening. Well, perhaps you've been conspiring with Terry behind my back. Has he asked you to find anything? Papers? Anything like that? Oh, don't be ridiculous. I don't have the slightest interest in Rutland. I won't have it, Marnie. You're hurting me. I put up with our current situation and I'll keep on doing so, but the bargain doesn't include your spending time with Terry Holbrook. Let go of my arm. That's going to bruise. I'm sorry. Is this why you're home early? To shout at me? I didn't plan to shout. I have to go to Liverpool on business, shareholders to pacify her. I'll be back late tomorrow. Promise me you won't see Terry Holbrook while I'm gone. It was an easy promise to make. I had somewhere much better to go. Not as much as usual. I'll be able to top it up very soon. You're in a queer mood today. Do you have a photo of Dad? There's one in my treasure bag. It's in the sideboard, bottom right hand. Why do you want a photo all of a sudden? When he died... Who told me? I did, I expect. I don't remember. You were only six. I don't suppose you remember much. I remember Dad's arms. Strong arms. Holding me tight. Keeping me safe. Yes. That was Frank. Is this it? Give it here. There. <laughs> Funny. He stayed young and I've got old. There's a cutting from the paper in here somewhere. I cut it out to keep. There. Deaths on active service. Frank William Elmer, HMS Cranbrook, on June the 10th, 1943, aged 41. All I had left. C can I have the photo? If you take care of it. It was Lucy who told me Dad was dead, wasn't it? It's a long time ago. I had a picture book with an elephant on. When Lucy told me, I put my head down on it and cried. The tears made the colour run till it looked like I'd been crying blood. I knew that day I'd never have complete protection or shelter or love again. What's the matter with you today? I sometimes think I'm different to other girls. I'd be thankful you are. Painting their toenails, flying after men. You're my good girl. My clever girl. I'm not sure it's always wise to be clever. What does the word childbirth mean to you? That damn clock striking eleven. What clock? In Mother's kitchen. It was Granny's. Boiling water. Oh, we need more blankets. Were you cold? Oh, I was warm as warm. Always. Till that tapping at the window. Why does Daddy tap at the window? Why doesn't he come the ordinary way? Why do I have to be turned out of Mother's bed? What's happening to you? I'm being lifted out of my warm bed and carried to a cold one. And somebody is tapping? The tapping's before. Always before. Sometimes it's a nail and sometimes it's a knuckle. The clock strikes eleven. There's tapping at the window. I'm lifted out of my warm bed and the door's shut. N noises in there. Mother's being tortured. And in a minute, in a minute, the door will open and the one who's torturing Mother will come in here and do it to me. Oh, God, help me. Now what's happening? The door handle's turning. I'm in my nightie. 
I'm pressing against the wall and watching the door open wider and wider. There's someone there. Mother! His mother! It's going to be all right now. And is it? Is it all right? She's coming in. Mother? No. It's not mother. It's someone who looks like her. Her hair's in tails like a witch. She's carrying something. She's holding it out to me. And I don't want it. I, I, I don't want it. Take it away! I have to leave. Mrs. Rutland. No, no, I, I have to go. It wasn't a memory. How could it be? And now I couldn't go back to Roman, ever. I'd think of something to tell Mark, but there was no time now. I had to repair my face for dinner with the Newton Smiths. Good evening. Oh, Marley, don't you look glamorous. Terry, I wasn't expecting you. Yeah, someone's ill. I'm making up the numbers. Now, who don't you know? For a moment, I thought I would be sick. Right there, where I stood. Mr. Strutt, allow me to introduce Mark Rutland. How do you do? And his charming new wife. Hello. We've met before, haven't we? I don't think so. In Birmingham. Two years ago. I don't think you were Mrs. Rutland then, were you? You were Marion Holland. Uh, I'm afraid you're making a mistake. The Marion Holland who was employed by my firm, Crombie and Strutt, as a confidential clerk between September 1958 and February 1959. My maiden name was Elmer. At the time you mention, I was living with my late husband in Cardiff. I don't know what's worrying you about the resemblance between my wife and uh, this Miss Holland, is it? I assure you, it can only be a resemblance. I knew my wife in Cardiff before we were married. I've known her ever since. Really, Mark? I never knew that. Well, I'm jiggered. I've never seen such a resemblance, really. Marion Holland was a redhead, but you know how women change their hair. <laughs> I'm so sorry, Mrs. Rutland. It seems I've made rather a fool of myself. Oh. We should go in. <laughs> Save the bargain of God. Fancy you two knowing each other all this time, even while Estelle was still alive, eh, Mark? Let's go in. <laughs> Say something. Thank you for covering for me. Are you very angry? I'm not angry. I'm knocked for six. I don't like the idea of my wife going to prison. Why would I? Did you think I wouldn't ask Strutt about it? Eleven hundred pounds, Marnie. Less than you took from Rutland's, admittedly. Did, did you... Sorry. Did Marion get swept away by the idea then, too? I never wanted you to know. I can believe that. Mary Taylor, Marion Holland, any more? Two. <sighs> I told you I was a thief and a liar. I said, forgive me and let me go. You wouldn't. So it's my fault. I didn't say that. No, you're right. I checked some of what you told me and took the rest on trust. I was in love with you. Trust has to begin somewhere. Well, this time I need to know it all. We talked till dawn. I told him about everything. Except Mother. I'd rather have died than have her find out I hadn't lived up to Grandad's standards. I can't ignore the fact that you're wanted by the police in three separate cities. I'm not wanted. Marion Holland is. And Peggy Nicholson and Molly Jeffrey. You're in danger every time we meet someone new. And now I've lied for you, I'm an accessory. Let me go. I'll disappear. People will forget. Listen, Marnie. What if I go privately to the three firms you stole from? Offer to pay back all the money if they drop the charges. You'd have to keep seeing Roman, of course, but... I'd be completely under your control. We'd be clearing out the past, finding a future together. I really want us to have a future together. You make it sound reasonable. Being honest is reasonable. Trusting people is reasonable. I'm, I'm asking you to trust me. We'd better get changed. We have to be at the meet by seven. We're still going hunting. Forio's been looking forward to it. The meet was in the grounds of a big house called Thornhill. 
The mount Rex had found for Mark was pretty temperamental, so I steered Forio away from him. Good crowd. More than I expected. They found. Should we ride together? I don't think you'll be able to keep up. Go on! And he wasn't. Before long, we were heading full pelt downhill, out into the open. My eyes watering with the speed. Forio was white fleck and his flanks were heaving. I gave him the whip to hurry him forward. Marty! Marty, be careful! On, Forio! On! You don't need a man. You don't want one. The skin will harden. You're in danger. It's the devil peering out at you. I won't be controlled. I won't be controlled. Every time we meet someone new, until the real you inside shrivels and dies. Who's tapping? Why is Daddy tapping? My good girl. My clever girl. And suddenly, it wasn't the fox the hounds were baying for. It was me. And I could gallop and gallop and twist and turn. But I could never get away from them. And I'd never be given a chance to explain. Because I was guilty. And this is what I deserved. And then there was a wall. And a ditch and a gully and... Money! Mark took the wall right behind us. He didn't ride well. He never had. And suddenly... <coughs> we were all down. All floundering in the leaves and muck. Oreo was trying to get up. Trying so hard. But he couldn't. The bone was sticking out through his skin. His cries were... And Mark... Mark lay face down in the wet mud, not moving. And I knew I had to do something. That there was only time to help one of them. Someone! Please! Someone help my husband! Forio had to be shot. Mark was taken to hospital with a concussion. All I had was stiffness and some bruises. If God exists, he has a strange sense of humour. How long have you been sitting there? You should have woken me. I'm so sorry about for you. What happens when a horse is shot, Mark? Do they bury it? I I couldn't bear to think of of it being sold. For... I don't think there's much likelihood. Um, I need to tell you something. I'm not going to fight the takeover bid at Rutland's. I'm going to sell my shares and walk away. If you think that's right. Oh, what a clean start, Marnie. For me and for us. Nothing's happened that we can't put right with some courage and some love. If we're together. I hope you believe that. Even on his sickbed, he wouldn't let go. I didn't have to answer, because the nurse came and told him to rest. I drove to the travel agency in the high street, and booked a ferry passage to St Marlo for two days' time. Let Mark make his clean start. He'd do it better without me. I drove home to pack a suitcase. Terry Holbrook was waiting on the doorstep. You know Mark sold out of Rutland. He mentioned it. Oh, look at you. Butter wouldn't melt. All those clever little visits to my poker parties. Those times way back when you opened my personal correspondence. I knew you were bogus, Marnie, but I didn't think you were a spy. How am I a spy? I had a good plan. Mark and I couldn't keep on fighting over Rutlands. One of us had to have control. I'm a better businessman than Mark. I talked up the company, went to a merchant bank, got them to buy up stock, even talked one of the sleeping partners into selling out, so that with the bank's support, I could be MD. I don't care about this, Terry. But now Mark sold his shares too. The bank has the controlling interest. An hour ago, they phoned me to tell me the name of the new managing director, and it isn't me. Was there no gentle breeze to warn you? Give Mark a message. 
Tell him I'm going to get him back. Visiting hour is six till seven. Tell him yourself. I tried to write Mark a note, but nothing worth putting down would come. Oh well. Best, in the end, if he thought the worst of me. I found his keys and drove to Rutland's. I didn't think there'd be much in the safe, but there was over six hundred pounds. I sat in that darkened office, by that safe, and I started to shake. I knew it meant something, but I didn't know what. I put the money back. Don't ask me why, but I couldn't steal anything else from Mark. I got in the car and drove like all the devils in hell were after me. The SOS came on after the news. Would Margaret Elmer, known as Marnie, last heard of working for a businessman named Pemberton, please contact her mother in Torquay, who is dangerously ill. Oh, thank the Lord. We was looking for you everywhere. Is she upstairs? How is she? She's gone, Marnie. A stroke. Yesterday, before they even put out the SOS. I don't understand. She's dead, dear. I'm sorry. The funeral's tomorrow. Lucy gave me Mother's old handbag. There was a photo of me at 18 and some old newspaper clippings. The one I'd seen about Dad's death. An announcement of my birth, her wedding card and an old dance programme clipped to it. Then another cutting, dated 1943. Lucy, what's this? Oh, dear. The headline said, Plymouth woman bound over on murder charge. I thought it must be someone Mother knew, until I saw her name. Mrs Edith Elmer, charged with the murder of her newborn child. Your mam was a lovely girl, dear. Boys always round her, but she kept herself pure. Had to. Your granddad was that fierce. <laughs> like something out of the Old Testament. We was all scared of him and your poor mother. Well, she was 33 by the time he died. Oh, she loved your dad. For all her flirting, he was her first. <laughs> Edie, well... She found she liked that side of things. She'd missed out for so long, she took to it with a passion for it, you might say. Mother did. When your dad went off to war, well, she got terrible lonely. And there were a lot of soldiers stationed locally. What are you telling me, Lucy? She seemed so respectable. Couldn't find no fault with her. Never in a pub, no nothing. But everyone knew. If a soldier came along after eleven, all he had to do was tap on the window. The clock strikes eleven. There's tapping at the window. Sometimes a nail and sometimes a knuckle. Then I'm lifted out of Mother's warm bed. Oh, Lucy. I remember. You can't, dear. Very careful she was to protect you. Always put you in the spare room, lock the door so you wouldn't see nothing. But I could hear groaning, oh. like someone was torturing her. Did Dad find out? He divorced her double quick. That's when we started to live with you. Oh, Marnie, dear, I don't want to tell you this. You can't not. Before long, it was plain as day your mum was expecting again. My brother? She denied it. I think she thought if she denied it, it wouldn't happen. The night it did, she knocked on my door. Lucy, she said, I'm very unwell. I went in, and there was you crying your eyes out. I put you in the spare room, locked the door. Poor Mighty was trembling and trembling. When the baby came, it was a 
beautiful little boy. He's perfect. I left Edie to feed him. I was only gone about 20 minutes. When I got back, the baby wasn't there. Edie was in bed, white as a ghost, her hair all ratty. In tails, like a witch. Oh, you, you don't remember, do you? Oh, I always prayed you wouldn't. I was pressed against the wall in my nightie. The door handle turned. Oh, Marnie. She was holding it out to me. She'd wrapped him in newspaper like he was fish and chips. Hide it under the bed, Marnie. There's a good girl. Mother? This is what happens when you let a man touch you. Blood and muck and pain. I comes back and says, Edie, where's the baby? She says, what baby? There's no baby. He was under the bed. I put him under the bed, like she told me. Dr Gascoigne came and they got her stable. But there was no getting round it. She killed that baby. Dr Gascoigne got her off in court. Said she was suffering from something... Something like purple... Purple insanity. It means when women go off their heads sometimes after childbirth. And afterwards... She said the baby died because Dr. Gascoigne messed her up inside. She convinced herself that she was a God-fearing woman who hated all that. She could convince herself of anything once she put her mind to it. All mother's life was a lie, then. I suppose. Like mother, like daughter. You don't mean that. That money I gave her, for you both to live on. I stole it. Oh, dear. I married the man who found me out. But I won't let him touch me. You know what being touched by a man gets you, Lucy? Blood Blood and and muck. Muck and and pain. pain. Edie was ill. You know that, don't you? No. She was rotten. And I'm rotten, too. How can you build anything decent on rotten foundations? All I know is, you just have to keep going. It's all any of us can do. Killing your child and having to live with that. Wanting sex and telling yourself you hate it. She was trying to protect you, dear. But she broke me. She wound me up so tight, she broke the mainspring. Mark didn't know what he was taking on. Maybe he isn't trying to control me. Perhaps he really does only want me to be happy. Let old Lucy give you a hug. I'm free now. I can do what I want now. Go anywhere. Free of Mark, the police, Forio, Mother. What the hell do I do? And that's when something shifted. All at once, I wanted Mark. I wanted to explain to tell him why I could never have been a normal wife. Nothing's happened that we can't put right with some courage and some love. Marion Holland and Molly Jeffrey and Peggy Nicholson were done for. But maybe, just maybe, I thought, there's a chance for Marnie Elmer. If Mark still felt the same. And somehow, I was sure he did. Next day, When we got back from the funeral, Terry Holbrook's car was parked outside. I heard the SOS on the wireless. I thought with Mark in hospital he might need some help. I could drive you home, Marnie, if you want. Oh, that's kind. I'd like that, Terry. Thanks. (sighs) Once again, Terry had come to my rescue when I least expected it. He even came into the house to get me settled when we got back. You're sure you have everything you need? You've been very kind, Terry. I'm sorry you and Mark can't get on. I'll try to make it up somehow between you. I'm afraid that will be impossible. Why? Who can that be? I'll get it, shall I? 
Even then, I had no idea. It was only when I saw that all too familiar face walking into my own living room. Good evening, Mrs. Rutland. Do you remember me? We met at Rex Newton Smith's. It's Mr. Strutt, isn't it? I'm glad you remember, Mrs. Rutland. Or should that be Miss Holland? Peggy Nicholson, perhaps? Or Molly Jeffrey? There are a number of us gathered outside waiting to meet those particular young women. Terry? I'm sorry. It's you who'll have to pay, Marnie. But Mark has ruined my life. Putting the woman he so clearly adores in prison for a long time, well... How could I resist? I always thought facing the people I'd stolen from would be the hardest thing of all. But funnily enough, it's the easiest. Whatever happens to me now is going to burn away all the rubbish, all the lies. Anything I come out with the other side will be real. Mark understood that. It's what he tried to make me understand. Whatever I'm left with will be real. That's all that matters now. In Marnie by Winston Graham, dramatised for radio by Sean McKenna, Marnie was Jade Williams and Mark Patrick Kennedy. Terry was Carl Prekop, Edie Elaine Claxton and Lucy Joanna Munro. Roman was Brian Bowles and Dawn Susie Riddell. The director was Marion Nancara. In a moment, Soul Music talks to Glenn Campbell, among others, about the enduring appeal of the ultimate country pop crossover track, Wichita Lineman. Then at four, Jane Garvey will be here. On Weekend Women's Hour this afternoon at four o'clock, why are some babies born so much bigger than others? When I was carrying my second child, 